All right. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us this evening for our educational webinar. Uh, my name is Michael York. I'll be your moderator throughout this evening and tonight's uh, tonight's presentation. Um, if you have any questions throughout tonight's presentation, please hold them off until the end. We will open it up for a question and answer uh, period at the end with Dr. Noguchi. Um, it'll just allow us to get through the presentation, and maybe there will be some questions that are answered um, that He'll, he'll answer for you off the top of your brain. So um, hold those to the end and then go ahead and uh, submit them into the Q&A function or the chat function, whichever you prefer. Tonight's webinar is on blefs and Botox. And as I, as I mentioned, it will be presented by Dr. Jonathan Noguchi. Uh, Dr. Noguchi specializes in oculofacial plastic and reconstructive surgery here at Harvard Eye Associates uh, and obviously has an extensive knowledge on tonight's topic. Uh, Dr. Noguchi attended Stan Stanford University, where he obtained his degree in biology. He subsequently completed his medical degree at the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine, followed by a year of internal medicine at Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. Dr. Noguchi then completed his ophthal uh, ophthalmology residency at Loyola University Medical Center, and Edward Hines Jr. Veterans Affairs Hospital in Chicago, after which he concluded his fellowship uh, up north at the University of Calgary in Alberta, Canada. So uh, needless to say, we're, we're very excited and very thankful that Dr. Jonathan Noguchi is part of the Harvard Eye family um, and that he's spending some time with us and sharing his evening um, to go over Bless and Botox. So without any further ado, I will pass tonight's presentation along to the aforementioned Dr. Jonathan Noguchi. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, uh, all the participants, for joining the webinar tonight entitled Blefs and Botox. Uh, as Mike said, my name is Jonathan Noguchi, and I'm one of the two specialists in oculofacial plastic and reconstructive surgery here at Harvard Eye Associates, the other specialist being the renowned Dr. Jeffrey Jacobs. I'd like to expe uh, express a special thank you to Erica um, Arrington and Michael York, our two business development managers for planning this talk for the community. And also a big thank you to the wonderful uh, Harvard Eye team members who make working here such a joy. So let's begin. So we're first going to start with Botox. Many of you have likely heard of Botox as a cosmetic product to help rid the face of wrinkles. Some of you have, uh, may have even tried or are currently using Botox. But what is Botox? Well, Botox is the registered trademark name of a toxin, um, that toxin being purified botulinum toxin. Botulinum toxin is a neurotoxin uh, that when used for medical or cosmetic reasons, typically paralyzes the muscle for anywhere between three and six months. It's actually one of the most deadly sub substances known to man uh, with 90 nanograms um, being a lethal intravenous or intramuscular dose uh, for a 70 kilogram or 154 pound person. Um, that's equivalent to about 12,000 units of Botox or 120 vials. So you wouldn't be anywhere close to that uh, for your cosmetic or medical consultations around the face. This slide demonstrates just how Botox works. Uh, so this is the neuromuscular junction where the nerve ending meets the muscle. Typically a chemical called acetylcholine is released at this junction when the brain wants one of your muscles to fire or contract. Uh, Botox or bot botulinum toxin prevents the release of that acetylcholine chemical by cleaving the snare proteins that are needed to dock and release that chemical into the junction. And so you can see there the, the circles uh, contain the red dots, which are the acetylcholine, uh, the snare proteins, which are depicted by the blue, yellow, and purple squiggles, um, help that circle or vesicle dock. And then they that in turn releases the acetylcholine into that junction. And so the Botox on the right side of the screen breaks those proteins down. So you can't get that release. I like to compare Botox blocking the release of acetylcholine to the jet bridge at an airport uh, pictured here. 
probably Chicago, uh, you know, where I did my training, very snowy, very cold. Um, the red arrow uh, here shows when there is no Botox present and people can get on and off the plane, just like the chemicals uh, can enter the neuromuscular junction. When Botox is around though, then you have a situation like the purple arrow uh, down below uh, where that docking mechanism is shut down and there's really no way for people to get on and off the plane. So going back to that original slide, uh, botulinum toxin is actually produced by a bacteria called Clostridium botulinum. The spores of this bacteria are found just about everywhere you look. It's in the dirt, it's in dust, river and sea sediment. Uh, though the toxin itself that the bacteria produces is typically produced in low oxygen or anaerobic environments, uh, such as closed cans, stagnant soil, uh, or in the gastrointestinal tract. So botulinum toxin can be found in uh, places other than Harvard Eye Clinics. <laughs> the bacteria that produces it can also be found in compromised canned goods. So think, you know, canned foods at the grocery store that have large dents in them as pictured here. And even in raw honey, which is actually why children under 12 months old are advised to not consume any raw honey. Uh, botulinum poisoning in infants can present as poor feeding or sucking, uh, constipation, floppiness, droopy eyelids, and a weak cry. Uh, it can be fatal, uh, but there are treatments with special antibodies. In adults, symptoms of botulism tend to be more droopy eyelids, double vision, occasional difficulty breathing or swallowing. Um, the name botulinum itself derives from the Latin botulus, which translates to sausage. A German physician, Dr. Kerner, pictured here, described the poisoning in 1820 when a group of musicians playing at a funeral developed double vision and muscle paralysis after eating, guess what, tainted sausage. Uh, a Belgian microbiologist who later discovered the bacteria responsible for botulism, uh, botulinum poisoning, later gave the pathogen the name uh, botulinum, again, derived from the Latin botulus for sausage. In uh, the 1960s, an ophthalmologist by the name of Dr. Alan Scott started using botulinum toxin for the treatment of strabismus or uh, crossing of the eyes. Uh, and eventually it found a use in treating forehead wrinkles in the 80s. Uh, Oculinum Incorporated was then created in 1989 and was subsequently acquired two years later by Allergan in 91 uh, with the name changed to Botox. And so here we are today. Uh, currently Allergan <coughs> manufactures Botox at an undisclosed location in the United States. Um, although they are headquartered in Irvine, just down the road. Um, and that product later ships to Ireland for packaging. Uh, as I mentioned before, because botulinum toxin is so potent, a single baby aspirin sized amount of powder actually contains enough Botox to make the $4 billion global annual supply of Botox each year. That's, that's all you really need. And so if you think about that in the whole, the whole world supply, um, can be found in the size of a small pill. Uh, Botox is generally sold in 100 unit vials uh, and each vial has about 0 0.73 nanograms. So that baby sized 81 milligram aspirin um, would make an equivalent of about 110 million vials of Botox. So quite a bit of Botox. Botox has a wide uh, range of medical indications, including treatment of migraines, excessive sweating, eyelid spasms, spasm really of any muscle, including the jaw, bladder, neck, vocal cords, uh, as well as the muscles that move the eye when they're misaligned. Then there is, of course, the cosmetic use of Botox to reduce or soften the appearance of so-called active wrinkles created by the facial muscles of expression. Uh, this last part is, of course, you know, what I offer uh, in my practice, what Dr. Jacobs also offers in his practice, uh, and we typically focus on the upper one-third of the face, um, though we can also uh, apply the Botox to other portions of the face as well. Uh, here are some useful diagrams demonstrating the anatomy of the facial muscles and their corresponding wrinkles. 
um, wrinkles actually appear perpendicular or 90 degrees to the muscle fibers that are causing them. So if you look on the left of the screen, um, labeled number one is the, the big frontalis muscle that raises the, the eyebrows among other things. Uh, and when that contracts, you see on the right side, the corresponding number one, these horizontal uh, wrinkles. And so you can see the, the wrinkles are horizontal while the muscle fibers are vertical. So they're 90 degrees apart or perpendicular. Uh, the top three injection spots tend to be the forehead, um, the wrinkles caused uh, by the crow's feet, by the orbicularis oculi, so number six in uh, the diagram on the left and number three on the diagram on the right, uh, and the frown lines or glabellar lines, uh, which are labeled number two on the right, uh, caused by the corrugators and procerus muscle. Uh, and those are sometimes called the 11s uh, for the fact that they make what appears to be a number 11 between your brows. So here's an excellent example of a crow's feet, uh, which again are caused by contractions of the orbicularis oculi muscle that surround the eye. A uh, very nice example of glabellar lines or the 11s uh, by corrugator and procerus. Here are some nice forehead wrinkles by that big frontalis muscle I've mentioned. And here even celebrities like Nicole Kidman uh, have some lines as well. These ones being the bunny lines on the nose caused by the nasalis muscle. And it's also good to note um, that all of the lines I mentioned are natural. Um, and although they can be treated with Botox to soften them, uh, the effect is temporary and usually lasts between three and six months. Uh, this photo here demonstrates the uh, typical injection pattern and sites for the um, forehead wrinkles some here for the glabellar lines, and here for the crow's feet. <clears throat> with Botox, I like to discuss the rule of threes with patients. So easy way to remember uh, how Botox, or when Botox works and for how long is with the rule of threes. So usually onset of action is around three days. Your peak effect, when you're gonna see the maximum effect of the Botox is around three weeks and it typically lasts about three months. Um, although some folks can see it last for up to six months. The general risks of the procedure include asymmetry, over or under correction, um, a droopy eyelid, lag of thalmos, which is the inability to fully close your eyes, a headache, bruising, uh, occasionally you can get a droopy mouth depending on where you put the Botox um, because a lot of the facial muscles are you know, in close proximity to one another. Um, I would say the one that tends to get the most attention is the droopy eyelid or ptosis. The typical incidence rate of that is around 2% and <coughs> excuse me, usually lasts uh, between two and three weeks. Uh, the reason you get a droopy eyelid is because Botox is about a four millimeter diffusion radius and the muscle that lifts the eyelid is very close to where we inject near the brow. Uh, and if that Botox tends to diffuse a little bit past what we call the orbital septum, it can hit that muscle that raises the eyelid and cause it to droop a little bit. Um, the good news is, among other things, that the Botox is temporary. And so this, of course, you know, uh, wears off. In the interim, we can oftentimes give an eye drop that will help raise the eyelid. Um, and that drop you would put every morning um, until things even out a bit. Um, but again, pretty low incidence rate, generally about 2%. We use a very, very small needle to inject the Botox, a 30 gauge needle. Um, and you can, you know, use different topical anesthetic creams to take the edge off the poke. But many patients don't seem to really notice the needle poke at all, um, surprisingly. Uh, we do tend to avoid performing Botox if you are pregnant uh, or there's a chance of you being pregnant. Although the current FDA classification of Botox is a category C medication, meaning there's not enough evidence one way or the other to prove whether the drug is safe or not safe to the fetus in a pregnant woman, 
Uh, I personally tend to err on the side of caution and recommend waiting until after the baby's born um, just to be extra safe. Uh, additionally, uh, with Botox, you should expect some red bumps under the skin where the Botox is injected, and those typically last for about an hour or so after the procedure. It is okay to apply light makeup to cover any bumps or bruises, uh, but we do recommend no strenuous exercise and no lying down for about four hours afterwards in order to really minimize the amount of bruising. And uh, finally, there's not really any concrete evidence uh, in the literature that you become immune in any way to Botox over, over time, requiring higher and higher doses. Uh, in fact, the opposite may be true. You can actually require fewer injections um, over time to achieve the same results. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later. Here's a nice example of some of the red bumps you might see after Botox, almost look like little bee stings. And again, these typically disappear about an hour afterwards. Here are some uh, nice before and after photos that I pulled from the internet that really uh, nicely demonstrate the effect of Botox. The first set of photos demonstrate Botox in the forehead. And you can see that on the left, um, the woman is raising her brows and you see those nice horizontal lines. Uh, and then after Botox, obviously not the same day, but maybe a few days to a few weeks after, um, the attempted raising of the eyebrow does not cause those same uh, horizontal lines. A second set of images for those color lines, as we have talked about between the eyebrows. Um, again, in the photo on the right, the patient is uh, unable to contract those muscles, and so you don't see those uh, deep set lines. And here in the, the last row, an example for the crow's feet. Um, again, softening of those lines. There are actually some new trends in Botox, uh, the most exciting of which is starting Botox at an earlier age, uh, before wrinkle setting. So people are now starting Botox in their late 20s and early 30s to delay, but not prevent altogether future uh, deep set wrinkles. The thought behind this strategy is twofold. Uh, the first is, or the first theory suggests that the fewer times a muscle is used, the less dermal remodeling there is, and hence the fewer deep set wrinkles there will be in the future. The second theory is that the muscles are, is that as the muscles are relaxed by the Botox, there is an additional behavioral change to not use those muscles as frequently in everyday life. Likely it's a mix of these uh, two competing theories um, that you know explain the uh, ability to try to offset the wrinkles or postpone the wrinkles uh, going forward. And also, as I mentioned before, why you may sometimes require a bit less Botox uh, the more you use it, particularly for theory number two. Um, as some of my patients have told me this, is that they, they do notice that they tend to use those muscles less and less uh, and that they, they tend to um, you know, get about their everyday life uh, using slightly different muscle expressions or facial expressions. Uh, a very interesting case report of this was published in 2006 by a surgeon out of UCLA. The researchers here examined a set of identical twin sisters. So one sister, who we'll call twin number one, got Botox two to three times a year uh, for 13 years. So from 25 years old all the way to 38 years old. Twin number two did not receive any Botox during that time period and they compared the two sisters when they were 38 years old. So right at the end of um, when twin number one was getting uh, Botox and then an, addi an additional follow-up at 44 years old. So about six years later. And during those six years, twin number one did not receive any further Botox. Uh, at, 38 year old, at 38 years old, the twin receiving the Botox did not have as many lines in her areas of treatment compared to her sister. And at the six year uh, follow-up at 44 years old, the twin who had uh, received the Botox previously did not have um, as many or as deep set lines at rest as her twin did. And so these next few slides have um, some of the photos that I pulled from this study. 
this photo demonstrates uh, twin number one, who's receiving Botox mostly in the upper third of the face. And <clears throat> pardon me, the circles here show where she was receiving Botox. So again, the crow's feet, glabella region, and the forehead. And this photo comparison shows those differences I mentioned. So on the left side of the screen is the twin who did not receive Botox. And on the right side of the screen is the twin who did receive Botox. The red arrows point out uh, the forehead and glabellar lines that are more prominent in the twin who did not receive the Botox. And you see those uh, in each row, especially compared to the twin on the right. Here you can see the twin on the left um, has again those static lines denoted by the red arrow uh, at the crow's feet as well as at the forehead uh, from a repeated use of the frontalis muscle and orbicularis plus the natural decrease in skin elasticity from collagen and elastin breakdown. Researchers also noted that in areas uh, that did not receive Botox, such as the nasal labial fold, um, as shown by the blue arrow, that these areas demonstrated actually a similar aging effect between the two twins, suggesting that the Botox in the upper third of the face was to account for the primary differences in wrinkles between the two. And here's a good example um, of the crow's feet between the two twins. Um, and of course, uh, this is just a single case report of two individuals. So it is difficult to apply this uh, outcome to the general population, but I did think it was a very unique um, study with nice uh, photographic um, displays of the uh, potential outcomes um, between what would otherwise be you know, two identical twins. So in terms of cost, Botox runs roughly uh, $15 per unit. Uh, on, and on the average, um, sorry, the average number of units required uh, for the upper third, so crow's feet, glabella, uh, glabellar area, and forehead can range anywhere between 45 and 75 units per session, depending on how much Botox you need. Um, I typically start folks out with a lower dose and then assess the response after one to two weeks. And if they need more, we can always add more at that follow-up visit. Now, Erica and Michael did mention that for um, anyone who is um, attending this talk tonight, we are going to run a little special uh, and offer the Botox at a reduced price uh, point per unit. Um, I believe $12, but they'll be able to, to confirm that with you um, potentially with a future email. So thank you for attending um, this, this talk. Excuse me. Another question that I sometimes get is, what's the difference between Botox, Dysport, and Xeomin? And so I've made this little table to briefly summarize those differences. Uh, for those of you who have never heard of Dysport or Xeomin, uh, they're competitors to Botox. So Dysport is produced by a French company called Ipsen and Xeomin by a German company called MERS Pharmaceuticals. All three have the botulinum toxin A product as their main ingredient. Uh, but they're really different how they're chemically produced. Uh, so Botox is via precipitation and redissolution. Uh, Dysport is by column chromatography and Xeomin uh, has the complexing proteins removed um, in its own chemical process. So that's sort of more than nitty gritty. Um, Botox has been around the longest and hence has had the most time to really become ingrained in modern day pop culture. Um, and it is what tends to be uh, I think used most frequently um, by a lot of practitioners. It's a very good medication. It's been FDA approved for uh, most parts of the face um, for softening wrinkles and lines. Um, Dysport uh, is said to have a slightly faster onset of action, uh, but really only by a day or two. It's also uh, thought to diffuse a little bit uh, wider compared to the four millimeters I quoted earlier for the Botox. Uh, and so some practitioners like to use it in different regions so you don't have to uh, have as many pokes in order to deliver the, the same effect. Uh, Xeomin does not have to be, re be refrigerated before use and so that helps its parent company with transportation and storage costs. And Xeomin also has the theoretical benefit 
of not having any antibodies forming against it since its complexing proteins are removed. And so it's almost like a pure botulinum toxin A. Um, though, as I mentioned before, there's really not a lot of evidence uh, that any anti antibody formation actually leads to decrease in the efficacy of Botox. All lasts usually between three and six months. That number may differ uh, sometimes on the lower end for dysport and zeomin, uh, depending on what data you're looking at. Uh, and they all cost roughly the same. I did put here the three to one dilution. So Dysport uh, is, has a different potency um, compared to Botox. And so while the price per unit is less with Dysport, you do typically have to use more of it to achieve the same effect. And so your total cost is gonna end up being about the same as Botox. And so that sort of wraps it up for um, Botox. So we're gonna jump into the next part of our talk, uh, which, are, which is blepharoplasty. So a blepharoplasty is an eyelid surgery um, that removes the overhanging upper eyelid skin, which is also called dermatochalasis. Uh, patients typically come in complaining of things looking brighter when they raise their eyelid up with their finger, the eyes feeling tired towards the end of the day, um, especially while reading, or even cars seemingly sneaking up uh, on their shoulder, their blind spot when driving. One of the obvious questions I get during my consultations is, will insurance cover the surgery? Uh, it's a great question. It typically depends on three different things. First, the skin has to be blocking a portion of your pupil or the black part of your eye. Uh, second, by raising that skin up on a side vision test, um, if your vision improves by uh, a preset amount that uh, the insurance companies dictate, then there is an argument that the skin is blocking your vision and that by removing it, we'd be improving that. And third, you typically have to um, document some sort of subjective complaint um, due to the skin that's interfering with your activities of daily living, as I mentioned before. If you do meet these criteria, then most insurances will typically cover the blepharoplasty uh, surgery. Blepharoplasty itself is a day surgery performed under local anesthetic. Uh, there is an anesthesiologist present to monitor your heart rate, your blood pressure, your breathing, uh, and to give you some relaxing medication under your tongue or through an IV. Um, but this is not general anesthesia, so there's no breathing machine or breathing tube going down your throat. Uh, for the surgery itself, I mark, mark out an ellipse of skin as demonstrated in the diagram uh, and remove that uh, plus or minus some prolapsed orbital fat beneath the skin. Uh, the whole time, we make sure not to take too much skin, otherwise you won't be able to close your eye. Excuse me. Um, and then after the surgery, you'll have stitches that stay in for about two weeks, as well as some bruising and swelling for two weeks. Uh, with your eyes open, our incision line blends in really nicely with the natural lid crease. And with your eyes closed, as when you're sleeping, you'll see a little red line where the incision was, and that will eventually fade over the course of a year or so. Uh, though I do caution that all of my patients wear ample sun protection, um, as the scar really likes to soak up the sun and get a bit darker. Uh, this photo nicely demonstrates uh, some of the puffiness uh, near the yellow arrow and yellow asterisk uh, associated with fat pad prolapse. Um, and we can address that during the blepharoplasty surgery as well. And that will really help with some of the aesthetics afterwards. Uh, the big things that we focus on, pardon me, in regards um, to planning for the surgery are number one, uh, whether you have severe dry eye since after eyelid surgery, your eyes will be more open and thus more exposed to the air. Uh, so dryness can potentially worsen post-operatively. And so we really have to be cognizant of which patients are coming in with severe dry eye. Uh, and then number two, whether you take any blood thinners, uh, as these can really increase the risk of post-operative bleeding complications. Um, if, if you're able to, uh, with an okay from your primary care doctor or your cardiologist, uh, we typically like to have you stop your blood thinners for a designated number of days before the surgery. As I mentioned before, you should expect about two weeks of bruising and swelling, 
and, and you must have someone to drive you home on the day of surgery, since any relaxing medications that you get from the anesthesiologist will impair your drive. Um, and finally, I do not uh, patch your eyes shut, so you should be able to really see right after the surgery, though the vision may be a little bit blurry from the antibiotic ointment we put on immediately afterwards. Uh, I do counsel patients that the surgery typically lasts around 15 years, uh, unless you have thyroid disease, you smoke, or you have sleep apnea. Those conditions do unfortunately prevent the surgery from lasting quite as long. Um, this is a really nice before and after photo from a patient I performed upper eyelid blepharoplasty on. Uh, you can see in the top uh, how the extra skin is really hanging over the eyelids, blocking the pupil, even blocking your ability to see her eyelashes. Um, and the photo below is actually just one month after surgery. So she, um, she did very, very well. And you can see much more of her eye, uh, as well as her eyelid crease, her um, eyelashes, which had previously been hidden by that skin. Um, she was quite, quite happy. She did very, very well. Uh, here's a little compilation of photos demonstrating uh, before surgery, two weeks after surgery, and about three months after surgery for another patient um, who had performed an upper lid blepharoplasty on. Uh, the red arrows here demonstrate really the improvement in that uh, what we call lateral or temporal hooding uh, that was obscuring her eyelid crease and her vision before surgery. Uh, and now you can see there's a bit more of a youthful appearance about three months after surgery. And then I included the, really the two week um, photo uh, to demonstrate some of that residual eyelid swelling near the eye, uh, eyelashes. Um, and this swelling can sometimes take a little bit of time to resolve. Um, but it, it, you know, I, I do like my patients to realize that they're not gonna go from before surgery to three months after surgery in a matter of days that it does take some time for that bruising and swelling to come down. And then this photo um, demonstrates another patient uh, with, again, with a very nice uh, lid crease being revealed once the upper eyelid skin um, is removed. And finally, I do like to tell my patients that I aim to have their result be either perfect or slightly underdone, but never overdone, um, as in this photo. We could always go back to take more skin later, but it, it's very, very hard to put skin back um, and to try to correct an overcorrection. So that's all I have for you today. I'll try to keep it um, you know, somewhat manageable and not uh, too, too long. Um, so I thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Noguchi. A wonderful presentation, especially with those pictures. Really, really enlightening to see kind of the dramatic improvement that patients can make with their vision. Um, and like Dr. Noguchi said, we're, we're happy to open it up for questions and answers. So um, if people do have questions, please feel free to use the Q&A function um, kind of at the bottom of your screen. Um, we will be happy to answer them at this time. Again, also, if you're anything like me and it takes some time for some questions to kind of dawn on you, uh, you are able to email us at the same email that you registered with, the marketing at harvardeye.com. Um, and we'll be happy to get those questions answered by Dr. Noguchi and, and respond to you um, at, a, at a later date. Additionally, you will have the ability to watch the video again. It will be posted on our YouTube page and we will be emailing it out as well. So if you would like to watch it a second time through, no worries, you'll be able to do so on our YouTube page. And it looks like we do have a couple of questions funneling in here. Um, so like I said, please feel free to use that question and answer function. Um, and the first question, Dr. Noguchi, is with regards to the insurance coverage, um, would you mind going over those slides just really quickly one more time? Sure. Let's see if I can find those. Here we go. Yeah, so the, the bottom half of this uh, slide. Yeah, so, <clears throat> you know, again, the, each insurance company uh, has their own very specific set of criteria 
that they require um, to be met in order for surgery to be covered. The general message that they're trying to send is that this is to help you see better as opposed to just making you look better. Uh, and so the ways that they try to quantify that or document that are number one um, with a photograph. And so during your consultation, I'll take a photograph um, of the eyelids uh, and that photograph will show the insurance uh, companies where the eyelid is, where that extra skin is in relation to the pupil or the black part of the eye. Um, they really want to be able to see that some aspect of that pupil is being blocked by the skin. Um, and, you know, consequently that it's affecting your vision. You know, all the light goes through the pupil and that's, you know, really how we see. Uh, and so if anything's blocking the pupil, then it in turn is thought to be affecting your vision. Beyond the photograph, um, they do require a side vision test. Uh, that doesn't take too long. I wanna say it maybe takes 10, 15 minutes to do. We test each eye one at a time and we test each eye twice. So the first time we test um, the one eye, uh, we do it in a relaxed state, meaning that the eyelid or eyelid skin is blocking the pupil. Um, we have you focus on a target, uh, you know, at the end of a little bowl. And then while you're focusing on that target, there are little flashes of light here and there. Presumably, if the eyelid is blocking your vision, you're not going to be able to see a lot of the flashes uh, up above. Um, when we repeat that test, you know, a minute or two later, we tape the eyelid up as if to simulate surgery. Uh, and repeat the test. And if there's a significant enough difference between those two um, untaped relaxed versus taped up to simulate surgery, um, then that typically can meet the insurance uh, criteria. And then of course the third one, which you know, mostly why people get, uh, or people are coming into clinic anyways, um, is to document again that, that subjective complaint, which, which is, you know, it's blocking my vision or my, my forehead. Um, you know, feels quite tight towards the end of the day. I've got difficulty reading. And that's just your, your muscles tiring out from having to try to lift your eyelids the entire day. Uh, like any other muscle, um, you know, if you, the more you use them, the more tired out they get. Uh, and so you can notice towards the end of the day that the droopiness is worse or that, you know, things like reading are a bit more difficult. So uh, I hope that um, answers your question about the, um, insurance criteria. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a couple of other questions that we're getting, and one, one of those is, do you do lower eyelid surgery? I do. I do do lower eyelid surgery. Um, that's a whole separate talk, <laughs> unfortunately, um, but it is something that I cover. Um, for lower eyelid surgery, you know, that, that's unfortunately um, virtually never covered by insurance. Uh, until gravity decides to reverse itself. Um, so usually folks will come in and they'll say, you know, I've got, got these bags under my eyes. Um, you know, what can I do about it? Those bags are the natural orbital fat prolapsing forward a bit um, as the natural, you know, collagen and elastin in your skin tends to get weaker over time. And so over time that, you know, the, the natural forces that usually hold that fat back um, weaken a bit. And so it kind of pushes forward. Uh, so for those surgeries, um, you know, usually requires a bit more anesthesia, not general by any means, but, you know, a bit more from the anesthesiologist, uh, to help you relax a bit more, um, make a little cut out here. And then also just underneath the eyelashes. And from those positions, we can remove that excess fat, also remove a little bit of extra skin that's down there. And sometimes also do a little mid face lift um, to help bolster the cheek area. And I just want to clarify this is not a full face lift. You know, we're not lifting the neck or the jawline, but we're focusing purely on the lower eyelids. Um, I, yeah. Uh, and then I also saw with that question can you sleep on your side after surgery? And does your head need to be elevated more than? Yeah. So, um, especially after surgery like that for the lower lids, even the upper lids, I sometimes recommend sleeping with an extra pillow. Um, 
the higher you have your head above your heart, the less blood's going to be pooling in those areas and the less bruising you're, ten you're going to tend to get. Um, yeah, a lot of, I think a lot of eye doctors and oculoplastic surgeons also tend to recommend sleeping on your back instead of your side. <laughs> Although, you know, I, I also sleep on my side from time to time. So um, also, I was also going to add on to that in additional to blepharoplasty with, with Botox injections. Is there any um, timeline with regards to sleeping or potential way that you should sleep after injections? Um, as I mentioned during, during the talk, uh, we usually recommend four hours um, before you can lie down. Um, and again, part of that's to deal with uh, bruising because we want your head above your heart um, during that time period. Uh, and the other part is also for, uh, well, I mean, that and exercise is a theoretical spread of the toxin, but, um, you know, there, there really hasn't been much reported uh, in terms of that toxin being spread from the face to other parts of your body uh, after working out, just more and more of a theoretical risk. Another question that we're getting is kind of the difference between bless and ptosis. If you, if you Great know. question. Um, so blepharoplasty refers to purely removing the extra skin that's up here. Um, and uh, the ptosis tends to refer more to um, a loosening of the tendon that actually raises the eyelid. Uh, so in clinic, um, you know, if you do come, I'll oftentimes use little Q-tips to roll back the skin and see where the actual eyelashes are in relation to the pupil or the black part of the eye. Um, if I roll back the skin and basically take that extra weight off and the lids look like they're in a great position, then it means that you just have a lot of extra skin overhanging, but no actual ptosis. If I roll back that skin and take the weight off, but the lid's still low, then that tells me that it's not just the extra weight of this um, skin that's bringing the lids down, but actually the, the tendon itself has gotten a bit stretched out um, over time. And that can just be time related. It could be from rubbing your eye. Um, it could even be from sleeping on one side or the other, you know, something as soft as a pillow rubbing against your eyelid for, you know, 40, 50, 60 years. Um, is actually, unfortunately, enough to stretch that tendon out over time. Uh, and so that's why, uh, again, <laughs> we typically recommend sleeping on your back, but we do understand that uh, some positions are more comfortable than others. Um, but, but that's the, the general difference between the, the ptosis uh, repairs uh, and the blepharoplasties. And, and if you have both, uh, that can be done simultaneously as well. Uh, so at the same time during surgery. Wonderful, wonderful question. Um, another one that we have is, is it possible um, that somebody could have a glabella injection only without the other area? Sure. Yeah. Um, I think the important part, and this is what I ask all my patients when I come in, is, you know, I hand them the mirror and I tell them what part bothers you, what part do you want addressed? Um, because some people, you know, really like their crow's feet, for example. Um, you know, they say, when I smile, I want people to you know, know that I'm smiling, et cetera. Uh, and so they won't want those parts touched, but they'll want other parts. Um, and so it, it's never a, um, you know, everyone gets the exact same thing. Um, just the, you know, for uh, completeness sake for the talk, I sort of group those all together since that's typical, those are the, the big three that most people want to address when they come in. Um, but, but to answer your question, yes, we certainly can just do the glabellar area, uh, no other parts. Um, you know, if, if that's what's bothering you. It looks like that summed up all the questions that we have for this evening. And like I said, if anybody does have stuff that come to mind uh, tomorrow, a week from now, what have you, please feel free to email us. The oh, And as I say that, we got one more, and this will be the last one for the evening. And that is uh, how many approximate units are needed for crow's feet? Um, so I would say anywhere between 15 and 30. So usually I'll start people off if they've never had Botox before, just sort of dabbing, you know, dabbling in it. I'll start them off at 15, so seven and a half per side. Um, and then a lot of people end up taking, you know, more like 30, so 15 per side. Um, but I usually start them off low and see if we can get away with that. Awesome. And like I said, if anybody has any questions, please feel free. The marketing at harvardeye.com. 
um, you know, we're, we're happy to go ahead and get those answered for you as is Dr. Noguchi. Um, and before we, before we end tonight's presentation, Dr. Noguchi, any last words for everybody? I just wanted to thank you all again for taking some time out of your schedule to attend this talk. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. No question is a bad question or a stupid question. Um, you know, just more information, um, you know, for you to make decisions off of. Um, but again, thank you so, so much for your time. Um, and I'm happy to, again, you know, answer any questions now or in the future. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for, like Dr. Noguchi said, thank you for all your time. And Dr. Noguchi, thank you for your time as well sitting down with us today and being able to cover uh, a couple of very interesting topics that I know people have a lot of questions about. So we, we appreciate that as well. Um, and on behalf of Dr. Noguchi, myself and the whole entire Harvard Eye family, we, we appreciate you guys for joining uh, and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Take care and stay safe, everyone.